Dr. Pani Sindham on the screen. Namaskar. And uh, sir is not new to Jain College. And because of this pandemic, only this program is going online. Otherwise, sir would have been the first person to come to this institution as he has done several years before. I welcome you, sir. Thank you, sir. The department, the college needs your good wishes and blessings to continue in the way that we are doing. I once again welcome you all to this program on behalf of the management, staff of the philosophy department. I wish and pray that many more such programs are organized and the students of the department benefit and go to the next level. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Very good morning to one and all present here. It's a very glad and pleasure to introduce <coughs> most reverend full uh, Professor Ali Salam sir. Before I do that, I'll just brief you about our department. <coughs> the department was started in uh, way back 18, 1989. Almost three decades it has sailed and it has produced a lot of gold medalists and good academicians and good citizens for the country. And right now we are four faculties in the department, myself and Dr. Krishna Kumar, Sumitra and uh, Dr. Ananda Krishna, head of the department history. He is offering a course on uh, history as allied to our uh, students, undergraduate students. I can proudly say that the department has the highest strength um, across South India, we have more than 210 students pursuing PA philosophy in Agachan Manmur Jain College at the Department of Philosophy. And every student is a uh, first generation learner. So we cater their needs. It is not only we teach philosophy, we also give them the basic life skills, almost train them to face all the difficulties and hurdles in their life. That is a part uh, of general direction of the department. And the college was started in the way back in uh, 1952. Our uh, no, Jain community started this college. They serve the community. They don't collect any donation or any capitation fee. It's just a few hundreds. They pay the fee and the examination fee and they pass out with their prime scholars and they get their degree. So that is a brief uh, thing about the college. And uh, now my task is to introduce this Pani Selvam sir. Well, it is great honor actually to introduce him. Today is the third day of the webinar, the ICPR webinar third day. And uh, I can probably say that this is the sixth, sixth series of periodical lecture sponsored by ICPR. We have been continuously doing this and uh, I take this opportunity to thank ICPR for generously you know, granting the fund for us to conduct this program. Uh, Dr. Yes, Pandit Selvam sir was a former professor and head of the department, the department of philosophy at University of Madras. He is very popular that everyone in philosophy knows him, not only in India, but abroad. He is known from Jammu Kashmir to Kanyakumari, and he is known from West Bengal to Rajasthan. Now that everyone will vouch for this statement, who are present at present, more than 100 participants are there in this. this. He is a national fellow. He has been conferred a national fellow 
by the ICPR. He is only the second person to receive in the country, and he is a general secretary for Indian Philosophical Congress and member of council in ICPR. And he is a president. Uh, we have to salute uh, Panisagam sir for its constant effort, the tireless effort, uh, which he started a movement called CPF, Chennai Philosophical Forum, which he has been uh, conducting a philosophical meeting uh, every Saturday for the past five years. He has been continuously doing neither calamity nor the pandemic nor any other situation deter him from doing this. He has been doing it uh, uh, offline mode. And uh, due to the pandemic, it is in now, now it is in an online mode. Sir, I, I, we salute you, sir, in this. And his field of specialization uh, is a philosophy of language and cross culture hermeneutics. These are the things which he really interested. If, I, if you ask me the field of uh, specialization, Almost every field is very familiar to him. And uh, I believe, guys, my dear students, the hours spent with uh, sir is better than a lifetime of ignorance. And I remember the Plato saying, a hero is born among uh, 100. A hero is born among 100. A wise man is found among thousand, but a accomplished, accomplished one might not be found even among hundred thousands. There is a man who has accomplished. So, my dear students, you have to be benefited from him. You have to lend your mind. Sir, I assure you and I believe that our students Mind is not in a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be ignited. And I believe that you are the right person to ignite our students' mind. I really thank you for being with us on this day. And uh, today's, uh, uh, today's listeners are tomorrow's leaders. That will be the stuff of a lecture today, my dear students. And uh, he has produced more than uh, 50 research scholars, PhD, more than 50 research uh, students have been awarded. One such candidate is our own uh, sir, uh, Prasanna Kumar sir is uh, his student and, he has, and therefore yesterday we had a speaker, Yen, uh, Yel Vijay. He is also you know, a student. So he has produced uh, 50 and the research articles. There are n number of articles. I can't read all this. It will take two to three days. Uh, with this start brief, uh, I would like to end my talk by saying that uh, no ICPR, no Indian Council of Philosophical Research. I can say, sir, sir, contribution of sir's contribution is so much that you no, know, we can say that the Indian Council of Panisalvam Research. That can be done. No, the so you know, I heard that there is a club in uh, Hyderabad who really debate on uh, Pani Salam's thesis. He has his, his thesis, he worked on uh, Shankara and Wittgenstein. I'm correct, sir. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, uh, so, he has a lot of fan club across India as well as across the globe. He has visited almost every country. And this, uh, I know he has bought more than three to four passports. You know, the passport line of Oru Sikura and Sri Delta Sari, there were four to five passports in Market Park Manigra. Uh, thank you, thank you for the opportunity, sir. Jahin, and uh, now I will welcome Dr. Pani sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you <coughs> Professor Manigandan, for your kind words. Of course, I don't deserve. Uh, all this, but anyhow, thank you, thank you for this. Uh, most revered and respected uh, principal of uh, A.M. Jain College, Professor Venkat Raman, my good friend, Professor Anand Krishnan, the head of the Department of Philosophy, Professor S. Manigandan, and the colleagues of Philosophy Department, Professor Prasanna, 
and uh, Professor Sumitra. I could see a lot of uh, students who are very kind enough to join this uh, program. At this juncture, I would like to welcome my good friend, philosopher and guide, I would say, Professor Dilip Kumar Mohanta. Uh, he is from uh, Calcutta University and formerly he was the Vice Chancellor of two universities. University of uh, Kalyani and then uh, Sanskrit universities. Presently, he is teaching in uh, Calcutta University. He is a well known scholar in Indian philosophy, especially in Buddhism and Western tradition. And he was so kind enough to join this program. He is also a member of uh, uh, ICPR and uh, Joint Secretary of uh, IPC. So I am very happy that uh, he is with us. Because he is the one who has moved uh, closely with uh, Jay and Mohanty. So I thought uh, it would be a special occasion for us uh, to request him to be here, and he was so kind enough to accept uh, my invitation. Thank you, Professor Mohanty. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And also, I welcome my good friend, uh, Professor Ravi, Ravi Chandran Murthy from Malaysia. Uh, she has also joined. And also, I am happy to see. Uh, my good friend, Professor Uma, Uma Shankar from uh, uh, SIES College. She is the principal and the head of the Department of Philosophy. And also, I could see uh, uh, Professor Amita Valmiki, who delivered an excellent lecture yesterday. yesterday. And also, I could see Professor uh, L. Vijay, who delivered a wonderful lecture on the first day. And there are many other scholars uh, and uh, my friends who have joined this uh, session. Thank you very much. In the first two days, I could not uh, 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 directly attend uh, this meet because I had uh, some uh, uh, research scholars meet uh, uh, organized by ICPR. So I was one of the evaluators, so I had to be there. I'm very sorry. But I had the privilege of uh, listening to Yal Vijay's lectures as well as uh, Amita's uh, lecture in the YouTube. And I'm grateful to Prasanna for uploading it. It was a wonderful lecture given by both uh, uh, Vijay and uh, Mita. Uh, I don't know how far I will be successful in my attempt. Anyhow, uh, I'm making a humble attempt. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, two concepts which are very predominating in Indian philosophical tradition. One is tradition in quotes, and the other is modernity in quotes. So how these two concepts uh, have been playing a very important role in understanding classical as well as a, a contemporary, or I would say recent also, uh, Indian philosophical tradition. So here I have taken two thinkers. Uh, I would call them representative thinkers uh, who talked about uh, tradition and modernity in a very positive way, uh, in a dynamic way, in a critical way also. One is Professor uh, uh, Daya Krishna, whom I love so much, whom I interacted with uh, him a uh, number of times, uh, and also uh, Professor. Uh, Jain Mohanty, I had the opportunity of uh, uh, presenting my paper in Jadavpur University when uh, he was there. So he is one of the uh, best uh, philosophers of our country. So I have taken these two thinkers as uh, representative thinkers who have elaborately discussed this tradition and modernity. So uh, this is my uh, agenda. Uh, let me go directly to my presentation. Uh, two quotations I would like to place before you for your consideration. One is by Adi Shankara and other is from Jawaharlal Nehru. One who does not know the tradition, this is a quotation, one who does not know the tradition, even if he is well versed in all the sciences, is to be ignored as a fool. This is from Shankara. 
And another quotation is uh, from Jawaharlal Nehru. He says, today, India swings between the blind adherence of her old customs and a slavish imitation of foreign ways. Right? In either of these, can she find relief or life or growth? True culture derives its inspiration from every corner of the world, but it is homegrown. This is from Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. Now, these two quotations clearly show that one has to be rooted in a tradition, because tradition, as Gadamer says, is an inescapable facticity which means whether you like it or not, you are in a particular tradition. Now, how do we define philosophy? Philosophy consists uh, of reflection of uh, man's experience in relation to himself. This, I think, uh, is a best definition of uh, philosophy. But uh, when you say reflection of one's own experience, it is very much essential for us to see what type of philosophy one is subscribing to. It is very important. By the type of philosophy, I mean whether one is rooted in one's own tradition or rooted in borrowed traditions of the West. In fact, this is a basic problem for Indian philosophers. If a person develops his uh, reflection or her reflection on a borrowed tradition, then one must see how far this would help. Now, the question that could be raised here is, can we ignore our own tradition and adopt the tradition which is completely alien to us? Here, uh, the philosopher whom I would like to refer is uh, Professor K.C. Bhattacharya, because his uh, uh, remarks on this uh, must be taken very seriously. He has written a very beautiful article with the title Swaraj in Ideas, which was published in uh, Vishwabharati Journal in 1954, wherein he makes a beautiful distinction between cultural subjection on the one side, one, on the one hand, and cultural assimilation on the other. What does this mean? He explains, for example, the dangers of cultural subjection and argues it is a suppression of uh, one's own traditional cast of ideas and sentiments without comparison or competition by new caste representing an alien culture. So this is a, a quotation which we have to uh, remember while reading or interpreting Indian philosophy. So what uh, basically he rejects is the hybridization of ideas and the patchwork of ideas from different cultures. Now this uh, has been echoed in the, the writings of uh, uh, other thinkers also. For example, uh, you can see this in the writings of Sri Aurobindo and also Dr. Radhakrishnan. In fact, Radhakrishnan says, uh, we cannot cut ourselves off from the springs of our life. So it clearly shows that there is a need for us uh, to visit uh, our ancient past and see how these uh, values which are inherited in Indian philosophical traditions are important. In short, I would uh, uh, say that the Indian identity has to be retained. This means philosophy has to be indigenous. That is, we cannot uh, neglect uh, the contribution made by our own thinkers. So as I said in the beginning, I would like to take uh, two uh, uh, thinkers, Dayaji and uh, Mohanti.
now uh, we have to remember the fact uh, when uh, the orientalist have made an attempt to revive indian philosophy there was some problem which means they rediscovered something new no doubt but that was indian seen through the western eyes so the western oriented indian intellectuals had their visions uh, colored by the western world this is one basic problem so in, uh, i would like to say that the dynamic uh, civilization of the west began to break uh, the age old indian traditions and ideals in fact at one stage it was thought uh, that ancient indian civilization would uh, just be replaced by the western so this was this was a problem and in fact uh, there are some of uh, some scholars who argue that this is a renaissance but uh, this is a renaissance there is a question raised by kalidas bhattacharya kalidas bhattacharya says this is not a genuine renaissance i would like to quote him what happens in genuine renaissance is that under the impact of uh, some powerful new ideas people with the living tradition adjust those ideas to the tradition what these english educated indians did uh, was to understand and interpret the traditional indian ideas that is indian philosophy for that in terms of ideas that were western this is a basic problem so he says this is not a renaissance so it uh, uh, is to be noted that uh, the period uh, between 1917 to 1920 is uh, very important for indian uh, philosophy and indian history why because it is during this period gandhi became uh, the leader of uh, liberation movement and uh, sri arbindo became a very prominent uh, philosopher because arbindo was dissatisfied with the traditional as well as uh, the western indologist way of understanding the vedas so he made a significant contribution by giving a new interpretation to some of our text so this uh, is something remarkable this i would say is a real renaissance uh, during the post uh, independence period two important works have emerged in indian context one is the current trends in indian philosophy this was published in 1972 uh, edited by it's a edited volume edited by k chachidananda murthy and uh, professor margaret chatterjee this uh, important work and uh, con uh, another important work is uh, by n k devaraja edited volume this also edited volume uh, indian philosophy today and in all these uh, volumes there is also another volume contemporary indian philosophy second series in all these three volumes you can see that many of our indian thinkers made an attempt to understand or reinterpret uh, contemporary indian philosophy or classical indian philosophy but uh, what happened was that in these articles published uh, in this textbook uh, they deal with the uh, western philosophical issues and discussions on indian philosophy is comparatively less this is a basic problem so this means uh, the problems uh, that are faced by indian philosophers are something very peculiar why it is because of the lack of sanskrit knowledge on the one side and partly due to the anti metaphysical trend in anglo american analytical philosophy which made a tremendous uh, impact on indian philosophy or indian classical indian philosophy but uh, there was no such problem uh, in the pre uh, independence period in fact uh, there are some scholars in india who argue that there is no progress of indian philosophy after the 15th century and and in fact they say that indian philosophy has ended with the madhva 
uh, how far this criticism is acceptable? And there are some others who hold the view that Indian philosophy has ended with the uh, Udayana, who lived during the later half of uh, the 10th century. Uh, this uh, criticisms have to be taken uh, very seriously because uh, there are uh, very many critics who argue that in the post-independence period, there is no creativity in the Indian philosophical tradition. Uh, they, they, the major criticism was leveled against by one Swami Akhenanda Bharati from USA. He says, in the contemporary philosophical issues, nothing new is emerging. And he says, our philosophers have been repeating what has been said, eh, or simply they have been reinterpreting what is very much available in a classical Indian text. Now, the, there are many uh, critics. Uh, I, I just I have taken one reference that is uh, Swami again in the Bharati. There are many other critics uh, who support this claim. So it is high time for us to examine this criticism in the context of uh, tradition and modernity. So uh, I would like to uh, throw some light on two great thinkers, Daya and uh, Jain Mohan. Now, with regard to Daya, I would like to say that uh, he has given us uh, a new way of looking at Indian philosophy. Uh, in fact, I always uh, would call him as uh, Socrates of India. Uh, he has written a number of uh, works. Some of them I would like to quote uh, quickly. The Nature of Philosophy, Social Philosophy, Past and Present, uh, Past and the Future, Considerations Towards a Theory of Social Change, India's Intellectual Traditions, the art of uh, conceptual uh, Indian philosophy, a counter perspective. This is a very important book published in 1991 by Oxford University Press. And I would request all uh, the uh, uh, students and research scholars to go through this book uh, one so that their perspective will change. And another important editor work of uh, Daya is Samvad. This is a very beautiful dialogue between two philosophical traditions, Indian and Western. He has edited this volume along with uh, M.P. Rege and Dwedi and uh, others. And also he has edited uh, uh, the philosophy of J. N. Mohanty. And uh, there are many other works. One important uh, work which I would like to quote here is uh, the developments in Indian philosophy from 18th century onwards. That is classical and modern, published in the year uh, 2002. Uh, this is a first volume that is edited by general editor is uh, 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 the senior most professor, that is uh, D.P. Chattopadhyaya. So in this book, uh, uh, Daya has elaborately discussed uh, the development of Indian philosophy from 18th century onwards. And also there are other works like uh, the Nyaya Sutras uh, and uh, the Prolegomena uh, to any future, uh, to future uh, historiography of cultures and civilization. All these are very important. And uh, I would like to state here that he was uh, the editor of uh, uh, the Journal of uh, uh, ICPR, Journal of Indian Council of Philosophical Research, from 1989 to 2007. And he has published a number of articles uh, in this volume. And also, uh, those who have seen the previous uh, journal, they would see uh, a, a particular column called uh, Focus where uh, as an editor of uh, JICPR, he used to raise some issues with regard to traditional as well as contemporary philosophical issues. So this is something uh, what he did. Uh, and he has written extensively on philosophy, sociology, economics, and literature. And uh, what is uh, very important here is uh, the Jaipur experience, uh, sorry, the Jaipur experiment which has uh, uh, started. Uh, that is uh, nothing but a uh, uh, weekly uh, meet of uh, the philosophers to deal with uh, uh, philosophical issues every week. And uh, another uh, significant point uh, uh, which I would like to mention is that he used to write uh, frequent letters to young uh, scholars and teachers of philosophy, of course, and also to senior professors, raising some uh, uh, philosophical issues. Always his uh, letters are very lengthy and uh, they are academic in character. They are not ordinary letter, wherein you will raise some philosophical issues and you would ask you to uh, give your opinion. 
so he was very very open minded this is very something which is very important he allowed the young scholars to write and uh, and publish uh, this is something unique and uh, while talking about himself he says i i quote uh, i was saved from the usual traditions of history writing as i was never trained as a historian and even in the field of philosophy i have been an outsider as i have not belonged to any school whether modern or traditional i am a thinker at large for whom the activity of thinking has always been more important than the products of that activity and hence i have always questioned the obvious so easily accepted by most of the philosophers so from this uh, quotation it is clear that he had a different perspective with regard to philosophical problem that questioning the tradition questioning some of the assumptions of a uh, uh, philosophy which has been predominating in indian philosophical scene so his object is objective i would say was to treat indian philosophy as philosophy and not as religion or theology or mysticism or spirituality so he wanted to rescue the philosophical traditions from the long and varied spiritual coast of india and he wanted to uh, find out the identity of a uh, indian philosophy especially uh, indian uh, classical indian philosophy and also he wanted to uh, uh, tell us that uh, uh, indian philosophy has undergone lot of uh, changes uh, development adaptation and promotion which is very much necessary for healthy physical and mental life and also he is of the view that indian philosophy in the past uh, one has to take seriously and we have to relate it with the uh, the contemporary issues uh, both in western as well as india and in fact uh, to show the living uh, continuity of the past to the present uh, was his uh, basic aim and uh, he argued that there are three major conceptions of philosophy uh, in fact in one of his uh, very beautiful uh, essay uh, is entitled three conceptions of philosophy this was published in uh, philosophy east and west journal in the year 1965 now here he talks about three conceptions of philosophy which are very much familiar among philosophers one is a carlich uh, potter's view uh, some of you are aware of carl uh, potter who has edited a number of uh, encyclopedias on indian philosophy he is a well known uh, thinker and uh, he talks about uh, i mean daya talks about uh, two presuppositions that are involved uh, in karl potter uh, one is that according to karl potter indian philosophy is concerned with moksha this is his basic presupposition uh, that is potter's presupposition and secondly the necessity of a speculative philosophy in indian tradition arises right because of the necessity of meeting the doubts uh, that are arise so these are the two presuppositions according to uh, carlich potter this view is uh, maintained by uh, by daya and second is a second conception of philosophy which is very much familiar in indian tradition is uh, the view of uh, kesi bhattacharya whom we admire a lot now he says according to kesi bhattacharya i mean daya says according to kesi bhattacharya indian philosophy is nothing but the theoretic uh, uh, counterpart to that of the practical side which is otherwise known as uh, sadhana or yoga so daya comes to the conclusion that in kcb there is a philosophical reflection which comes to uh, comes to redundant or superfluous because indian philosophy according to uh, kcb talks about uh, the theoretical as well as practical aspect and the practical uh, orientation is emphasized in yoga so daya is of the view that uh, uh, while maintaining this view kesi bhattacharya is of the view that uh, the philosophical reflection becomes uh, superfluous 
Then the third uh, conception of philosophy, according to Dayan, is that Indian philosophy should be viewed as philosophy proper, proper in quotes, and uh, it has nothing to do with uh, moksha. So Indian philosophy is philosophy proper because during 1970s there was a very uh, uh, lengthy and uh, uh, very serious debate that was going on uh, whether philosophy in India is moksha oriented. So that is of the view that Indian philosophy has to be uh, studied as philosophy proper, right? Philosophy proper and it has nothing to do with moksha. Indian philosophy is philosophy proper and not something radically different from what goes on in Western tradition. This is a very, very serious uh, uh, um, uh, concern of Gaya, which means most of the time, uh, unfortunately, I would say that we consider uh, philosophy as a moksha oriented philosophy. But Gaya says uh, this is not moksha oriented uh, philosophy. And uh, he says, further Daya says, that moksha is not uh, the exclusive concern of Indian philosophy. And it is not uh, a prominent in Indian philosophy. And many of the thinkers and many of the schools, according to him, are not concerned with uh, uh, even marginally. So he says it is a myth. What is the myth that we think uh, that philosophy in India is a uh, moksha oriented you now uh, this is a very significant uh, point of uh, daya and also uh, i would like to quote uh, his another beautiful essay and i would recommend this for uh, young uh, teachers and young scholars because your uh, approach to philosophy will change of course there are some uh, senior professors uh, who are not uh, uh, um, who are not uh, 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 appreciative of this uh, conception of three myths of philosophy. There are the seniors who criticize this uh, uh, three uh, myths which he has talked about. But uh, uh, I would say that uh, his essay, Three Myths of uh, Indian Philosophy, challenges uh, some of the basic assumptions of Indian philosophy. So we have to read uh, this uh, uh, essay. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept Laya or not, you have to see the counter perspective. You have to see how Indian philosophy could be viewed from different uh, perspective also. So what are these uh, uh, three uh, uh, three uh, myths? At least I'll take uh, two myths. Uh. One is uh, we have a myth uh, that Indian philosophy is uh, spiritual by nature. And Daya says it is a, a mythical claim. And further he says it should not be confused with the spiritual salvation, which he says, of course, is accepted by culture. And moksha, he says, is a later addition as the fourth goal. This is a very significant point because uh, in the many of our uh, Tamil texts, especially in Tirukkural, you see moksha is not uh, uh, discussed at all. We talk about the first three Purushartha also. And there are many Tamil scholars who are of the view that uh, Tamilians uh, were not concerned about moksha and it was a later addition. And Daya Krishna also talks about uh, the concept of moksha as a, uh, a fourth purushartha at a later period. So this is the first uh, myth and second myth is uh, authority. Uh, we have uh, always uh, a concern for authority. Now what do we mean by that? And uh, Daya is of the view that we always classify philosophy into orthodox and Heterodox, heterodox schools. Uh, this, uh, he says, is basically wrong. Now he says, uh, are the Vedas the authority of uh, all schools of philosophy? This is a very, very fascinating question because uh, since, uh, unfortunately, we, we, since we consider Vedas as uh, something uh, which is uh, primary, we say that uh, uh, some systems which accept the authority of Vedas are Astika, and which deny the authority of Vedas as Nastika. Now, the question that is raised by Daya is, why should we treat uh, Vedas as the authority of all schools? Now, I always uh, uh, consider this as a very significant point because uh, uh, since we have this criterion, we have neglected the role or the contribution 
made by regional philosophy. For example, while talking about uh, a school like Shaivi Siddhanta or the contribution of uh, Siddhas in uh, Tamil tradition, we have not included them in, uh, in this uh, art, um, orthodox or heterodox school uh, because of the reason that uh, they do not come under the category of or the main framework of uh, the authority of Vedas. And not only that, in, if you take each and every, every, every cultural tradition of India, Bengali tradition or Telugu tradition or Malayalam tradition, each and every tradition has, uh, uh, they have their own uh, contribution to make. But all these are not uh, uh, finding a place in, uh, uh, in, in, in this classification. So he questions uh, the authority. Uh, in fact, he asks this question, is it true that Mimamsa and Vedanta consider the whole of the Veda as authority? And, uh, and he says, uh, the authority goes on changing in each school. And he quote a number of examples. One example that is given is that uh, Nyaya school has changed after Gangisa. And also he says that uh, Advaita after Shankara has changed. And also uh, Advaita after uh, Padmapada, Vachaspati, and so on, where there is a change. So this uh, is a very serious uh, uh, remark made by Daya with regard to the authority. So one thing we have to keep in mind is the way in which our schools are classified. What uh, made us to classify Indian philosophy in this uh, two kinds of uh, schools as Asika and Nastika. So this is a very uh, stimulating uh, 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 approach uh, of Daya, which has to be taken very seriously. So what uh, Daya presents is a fresh uh, way of looking at Indian philosophy. And uh, he says, we cannot uh, have a fresh look at uh, Indian philosophy as long as we retain these myths. So his remarks on Indian philosophy is something very remarkable. I would like to quote him. He says uh, in the Indian philosophy, Counter Perspective, that is a book which I quoted early. Uh, this is a very important quotation. And I always uh, 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 quote this um, whenever I talk about Daya. The quotation is, goes like this, I quote, The dead, mummified picture of uh, Indian philosophy will come alive only when it is seen to be having a living stream of thinkers who have grappled with the difficult problems that are philosophically as alive today, as they were in the ancient past. It is time, this is very important, it is time that this false picture is removed and that the living concerns of our ancient thought are brought to life once more. From this, uh, it is very clear that Daya is not totally rejecting it. What he wants us to do is yeah. to reinterpret uh, the tradition so that it can have a direct bearing on our life. Which means that uh, Daya Krishna has given uh, a spectacles, a new spectacles by which we can look at uh, Indian philosophical tradition. Whether this uh, methodology which is given, whether is acceptable or not, uh, is a different issue altogether. But I am of the view uh, uh, that uh, this method is very much in, uh, important, but there are may, very many traditional scholars who will not accept it. But uh, let us see Indian philosophy from a different perspective. This is my uh, uh, view. And uh, finally, uh, uh, before I close uh, um, Daya Krishna's approach to Indian philosophy, I would like to make a reference to his uh, very important book published in 2002, wherein he talks about uh, the developments of uh, philosophy, Indian philosophy, from 18th century onwards. He actually uh, deals with how uh, in the intellectual traditions of uh, uh, India, there could be five different periods. That is from 1000 to 1200, from 1200 to 1560, then 1560 to uh, 1720, and uh, 1987 up to 1918, uh, sorry, 57 and 1857 to 1947, and finally, 
from 1947 onwards so in this book he examines uh, the uh, critically uh, the contributions made by thinkers like raja ram mohan roy dayanand saraswati kesi bhattacharya kalidas bhattacharya n v banerji t r v murthy d p chatopadhyay jayan mohanty uh, k ch chanand murthy rajendra prasad and others so this book uh, gives uh, uh, a panoramic picture of uh, indian philosophical tradition wherein you see how philosophers have discuss uh, uh, philosophical issues uh, how uh, these issues are important or how these issues are not important uh, is uh, the main focus of uh, uh, i mean uh, daya so uh, he we can see uh, the interrelation between past present and future in his uh, writing so daya's uh, way of uh, looking at indian philosophy is always uh, refreshing and he has always something to say new this is very important if you take any philosophical problem you can see the creativity in uh, his approach and uh, he always question the methodology which is adopted in a particular school of thought so his questioning is very important i quote uh, his uh, very important um, statement he says people have to be encouraged right people have to be encouraged uh, to ask questions to see the problems and to attempt solutions that what they attempt in this regard is treated with a genuine respect so it is very clear that daya was very much concerned about uh, uh critiquing the tradition it is not that simply as accept the tradition there is a place for tradition in his writing but at the same time he says uh, that uh, uh, there is a need for to critique our uh, tradition so that uh, some uh, new meaning will emerge the tradition there were uh, there are many great uh, uh, indian philosophers like uh, professor r balasubramanian uh, who uh, uh, made an attempt in their writings to critique uh, daya's approach to indian philosophy in fact they would say uh, that daya has come to indian philosophy uh, very late and daya when once he heard this uh, uh, from the mouth of uh, rb and he simply laughed but i said that what what's wrong in that whether one comes from the begin one exists from the beginning or one joins later that is immaterial what his contributions or her contributions to indian philosophy is something uh, important so this way of understanding uh, 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 is something very important of course i have a lot to say on daya but i i refrain from doing that uh, uh, because i i am uh, also interested uh, in discussing uh, Uh, jain mohanty who is a very fascinating uh, philosopher uh, he is uh, 93 years old and uh, his uh, philosophy uh, like uh, the philosophy of daya is something uh, refreshing and something uh, uh, very very uh, useful for the students of philosophy with regard to daya i would uh, uh, like to uh, close by saying that no one can dispute uh, uh that daya has given new way of looking at philosophical problems by connecting uh, the past present with that of the future as gadamer says that uh, though the past and the present are separate horizons they are not closed off from each other so when we understand the past we are expanding our horizon and not uh, stepping out of the horizon into the other horizon so now uh, we will uh, move on to uh, mohanty mohanty was born in the year 1928 uh, and uh, we would call him as uh, bhishma pita pitamaga uh, because uh, he is one of the senior most uh, uh, professors who has been uh, uh, writing extensively on indian and western philosophy some of his books uh, i would like to quote very quickly uh, the philosophy of edmund husserl phenomenology phenomenology and uh, ontology essays yeah. on indian philosophy traditional modern classical indian philosophy logic truth and modalities between two world east and west 
reason and tradition indian thought husserl theory of meaning explorations in indian philosophy a very important book lectures on consciousness and uh, interpretation this edited one and the self and its other self and uh, and its other it's a very small book a uh, very very important book. now in all these tradition in all these uh, works uh, you can see the analysis of uh, both uh, indian and western uh, i would always uh, uh, say that uh, the uniqueness of uh, uh, the uniqueness of uh, uh, jain mohanty is that uh, he could successfully combine indian and western while talking about advaita vedanta or buddhism you try to apply the phenomenology of the west so this is something remarkable because uh, he has the tools of uh, understanding both uh, indian and western uh, as a, as a, as a specialist in uh, phenomenological tradition of the west he is able to apply the methodology which is very much available in phenomenological tradition and apply that to indian tradition and see how far it uh, could be acceptable so it is very much essential uh, that we have to look at uh, mohanty both from indian as well as a perspective uh, indian as well as western perspective now tradition how do we understand the tradition tradition is a finite unfolding of the infinite content a history of finite actualization of an essentially exhaustible or infinite truth and uh, gadamer has very beautifully stated that uh, tradition is inescapable facticity what does this mean that is you cannot as i said in the beginning you cannot escape from the tradition it is tradition which connects the past present without the future and every retelling of uh, the past uh, is nothing but renewal of tradition so there is a continuity uh, and we find uh, i mean there is a continuity between the past present and future and you see this in the writings of uh, both uh, uh, daya as well as uh, uh, mohanty so every retelling of uh, tradition is nothing but the renewal of uh, our tradition so our 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 belongingness to the tradition is our primordial ontological condition this is a very important statement what is that that we belong to the tradition and in fact it is a, it is a very essential condition and we start our life uh, uh, from the uh, uh, tradition that is the reason why i said in the beginning whether you like it or not you are placed in a tradition you are always guided or influenced by the tradition so tradition in fact uh, is nothing but uh, the locus of understanding we are shaped by our past uh, uh, we are we are we are uh, shaped by our past in various ways and this has a tremendous influence on our understanding so the past and the present are related and it becomes a continuous uh, process uh, through the tradition so in tradition according to mohanty we think in our own concepts this is very important when he say when he says that we think in our own concepts we mean that how we develop our own concepts uh, by depending on our own roots so mohanty makes a, a very beautiful distinction between tradition and orthodoxy this is a very important fact because sometimes uh, there is a confusion between tradition and orthodoxy so what is the difference orthodoxy right consists in fossilizing tradition into a lifeless unchanging structure right on the other hand tradition is a living process of creation and preservation of signification now it is very clear from this uh, distinction of uh, between orthodoxy and uh, tradition uh, that orthodoxy is something stagnant uh, it is something which is thrusted thrusted on us and we cannot uh, move move further because uh, we always believe that simply we have to follow the orthodoxy but uh, tradition is different from orthodoxy because there is always the process of uh, creation uh, in a tradition or tradition allows a uh, uh, 
interpretation, reinterpretation, and further reinterpretation, and this goes on. So when a tradition is alive, then it can grow. This is a distinction which he makes between tradition and uh, orthodoxy. So when the tradition is alive, then it can grow. But uh, orthodoxy is not alive. It is stagnant. That's why it, I said it is stagnant. Uh, it, it has become stale. So there cannot be any progress. It cannot grow. It is something which is thrusted on us. So tradition can create. It can respond to new situations and uh, challenges. So tradition can uh, face uh, the challenges that are thrown on it, which means a tradition can examine some of the challenges uh, which are available and it can make an attempt to uh, recreate the tradition so that some of the criticism that are leveled against tradition can become uh, invalid. So by making a distinction between orthodoxy and uh, and tradition, uh, Monty very clearly argues that we have to transcend this, uh, 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 what is called uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, orthodoxy and move towards uh, uh, tradition. Now, what does uh, modernity mean according to him? Uh, he asks this question, what does modernity mean? And uh, in addition to that, there is also another question which he raises. In this context, because they are they have to be taken allied concepts. He asks this question: Are tradition and modernity not uh, irreconcilably opposed to each other? In short, he is asking the question whether tradition and modernity are opposed to each other. And uh, while answering this question, she says, especially you see this in this book, uh, Reason and uh, Tradition in Indian Thought. She says, if modernity, I quote him. If modernity means outright rejection of tradition, right? Then of course there is no promise of a fruitful dialogue and mediation. So he says uh, further. He says that there are two ways of uh, understanding modernity. What are they? First, he says modernity consists in addressing oneself to what is contemporaneous. A very important one. This means for him, modernity is a contemporary ongoing dialogue. You can't stop it somewhere. Your living tradition, according to Jain Mohanty, challenges the thinker. And the second aspect is that the idea of criticism. She says, tradition always demands respect and continuity. Here, the traditionalist might say that in truth, any critical norm should be internal to the, to, to the tradition, which means that uh, one can critique a tradition, but it should be internal. This is a very important uh, point, and uh, no doubt uh, in the uh, Monty is writing there uh, uh, would be an answer. In fact, I would I would uh, examine him or I would analyze him in this way. So, no doubt, the critical evaluation of the tradition is uh, important, and the critical norm should be uh, internal to the uh, tradition. By this, uh, uh, I mean we have to understand this in this way. Tradition is not something which uh, one can reject. But uh, the core element of a tradition cannot be rejected. There is always a distinction between the core and the periphery. The periphery or the outer, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the outer mode of a tradition can be changed, can be modified, can be rectified, can be revisited. All this can be uh, done with regard to the external structure or the outside uh, uh, tradition, outside of the tradition. But the core elements of a tradition, right, cannot be changed. And I would like to uh, understand this uh, 
from my own perspective that is while interpreting a tradition i would uh, i would like to uh, make a comparison between uh, uh, mohanti and uh, and uh, gadamer gadamer who talks about tradition like uh, our uh, great professor mohanti he is of the view that since uh, each and every one of us uh, is placed in a particular tradition we cannot uh, deviate from the tradition uh, let me give one example this is how i understood while interpreting a particular text for example say advaita siddhi now how do i interpret it when i interpret a text like advaita siddhi i can only give an advaitic interpretation to the text this is what i i mean by uh, uh, the core uh, core uh, structure of uh, the tradition i said it has to be retained so which means uh, you cannot give another kind of interpretation which would uh, Uh, demolish uh, the existing uh, structure of the tradition because the uh, text uh, the advaita siddhi is written from a particular standpoint uh, if we violate that then uh, we make uh, what is known as a uh, hermeneutic violence so while uh, reading a text uh, i would say that uh, by following the damarian principle three things have to be followed one is a uh, tradition that is one has to be within the tradition Uh, one can reinterpret, of course, but at the same time, the second principle is uh, uh, interpretation and understanding, and third is the language, uh, which plays a significant role. So these three aspects are very much emphasized in hermeneutical tradition, and uh, and uh, uh, then Mohanty also emphasizes uh, these uh, three aspects in all his uh, writings, and um, so uh, the traditionalist uh, would say. that there can be some uh, uh, criticism but it should be internal to the tradition uh, there are many thinkers from within the tradition have challenged the basic framework monty is monty gives a very beautiful example monty says that buddha for example has challenged the atman tradition right and nagarjuna challenge the metaphysical and epistemological tradition so i quote mohanty here a task which uh, the indian philosopher of today has to face uh, with our immediate predecessors either over either overlooked or took for granted is to decide what is living and what is dead in indian philosophy this uh, quotation has a lot of uh, significance uh, in contemporary uh, uh, indian philosophical debate because uh, professor dp chatopadhyay we call him senior uh, chatopadhyay because uh, there are two uh, great uh, chatopadhyay uh, the senior chatopadhyay who is the author of uh, lokayita and all he has written a very important book what is living and what is dead in indian philosophy and this is also a very important book and i would recommend this for our all uh, uh, indian philosophy students wherein you can find out uh, that it is a need of the hour to reject uh, those issues which are already dead as because it is stated in our tradition there is no point in clinging to these uh, 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 age old issue issues uh, which are not relevant now uh, mohanty is uh, is of the view that we have to make uh, uh, the decision what is living and what is uh, dead in indian philosophy uh, he examines the fundamental distinction that exists between indian and western thoughts uh, he shows uh, that how a distinction between uh, spiritual and non spiritual intellect and intuition logic and non logical can no longer be maintained this uh, this is a very very significant point why because most of the time it is said eh, that indian philosophy is spiritual whereas western philosophy is not spiritual we say western philosophy is uh, intellect whereas indian philosophy is intuitive and we say it is non logical whereas western philosophy is uh, logical all this distinction cannot be accepted according to uh, mohanty he says these distinctions right he says cut across uh, the indian 
Western dichotomy. Uh, one of the important themes uh, on which uh, Mohanty made a very significant contribution is about uh, the role of tradition and modernity in Indian philosophy. Uh, he has a very lengthy essay, which is published in, uh, uh, in his book, The Collection of Essays, uh, uh, wherein he says uh, how tradition as well as uh, modernity can be placed side by side is not one replaces the other. He says, unless one transcends the tradition, one cannot and need not ask such a question, namely, what is Indian philosophy? Yet, he says, yet, unless one understands the tradition from within, one cannot answer it. We are, further he says, we are thus confronted by a paradox, a paradox which we need not resolve. Now, Mohanty is very bold, I would say, is enough to ask the question why one should uh, close uh, the acceptable Vedic interpretation with Sayana and why not admit uh, the Aurobindo and uh, Dayananda. So what he is trying to say is, that there are uh, different interpretation, uh, there are different uh, Vedic interpretations which are available in uh, the writings of Sri Aurobindo and Dayanata, Dayananda. Why can't uh, we uh, read them? Mohanty's expertise in Indian as well as Western philosophy is visible in his study of uh, the concept of truth, consciousness, meaning, and rationality. For him, both the theoretical rationality and practical rationality coexist in Indian thought. In fact, uh, one of the uh, commentator, Professor Bina Gupta, she has uh, written extensively on uh, uh, Professor Jain Monti. She says, there is a misleading inference made from the etymology of the word darshana, that since darshana derives from the verbal root drash, that means to see philosophy on the Indian view as something to do with see. Does then, she is asking this question, does then each philosophical system represent, articulate, or conceptualize a new way of seeing? A person being is not depressed uh, being in the world, but being in the world that is grounded in the possibility of a transcendence into the beyond." Unquote. Mohanth is uh, writing in analytic philosophy, modern logic and phenomenology helped him to relook uh, Indian philosophy from a new perspective. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I would say this is, a, this, is a, this point I would like to stress, uh, uh, so I want to repeat it. His uh, understanding of uh, analytic philosophy uh, the Western analytical philosophy, Western phenomenology, and Western hermeneutics, all this uh, really helped him to relook at uh, Indian philosophical tradition from a new perspective. Uh, here I would like to quote uh, late Professor Suresh Chandra, uh, who uh, in uh, one of his uh, uh, reports uh, submitted to, uh, uh, to uh, UGC, which later is compiled by Professor Sajanda Murthy, uh, Philosophy Today, uh, wherein Professor, uh, uh, Professor uh, um, Suresh Chandra argues that there are three kinds of philosophers in India. Because why I am mentioning this, this has a, a close link with, uh, with uh, uh, Jain Mohanty. There are three kinds of philosophers in India. The first group or the first uh, classification is that uh, those philosophers who are very well versed in Sanskrit, they are great pundits, uh, they write everything in Sanskrit, right? They are well-known scholars, their knowledge is something uh, really admirable, and we can learn a lot uh, by sitting at their feet. They are very great thinkers. Unfortunately, they cannot uh, uh, use the uh, uh, English language. So we are not uh, getting uh, proper uh, support or help from these scholars. Provided you know Sanskrit, you will appreciate uh, their scholarship. 
So this is very much essential. So this is the first group of philosophers. And the second group of philosophers, he says, those who write uh, only on Western philosophy. There were many thinkers in India who write only on Western philosophy. And uh, unfortunately, uh, those who write on Western philosophy alone is not uh, recognized uh, properly, right, uh, in uh, India. Uh, sorry, uh, not properly in Western countries. Uh, one exception is uh, Jail uh, Mehta, of course. But normally they are not uh, ready to recognize uh, uh, the Indian writing, Indian writers uh, writing on Western uh, philosophy. Uh, there are many scholars, but uh, I don't want to quote them. Uh, what is uh, important is that there is uh, the uh, Eurocentrism that is uh, involved uh, uh, in, uh, in the European scholars. And as a result of that, they are not able to recognize uh, 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 Indian scholars writing on Western philosophy. Uh, in fact, uh, they say that uh, as Indians, we cannot understand Wittgenstein or Kant uh, um, and others, other Western thinkers. In fact, uh, I had a, a big uh, fight with one of the Western scholars uh, in uh, Satinilayam in Chennai, wherein one uh, uh, Western thinker said that uh, we cannot understand uh, Wittgenstein or Kant because we are not in their uh, cultural uh, you know, background and all that one. Anyhow, that's a different issue altogether. That is the reason perhaps uh, why, why uh, Suresh Chandra calls uh, all of us as uh, Indian Wittgensteinian. Anyhow, so this is a second kind of philosophy or a second uh, group of philosophers. And the third group of philosophers are very important. That is uh, those who are well versed in uh, uh, Western philosophy and also they are equally well versed in Indian philosophy. Though what, so what they do is they apply some of the Western methodologies which are very much available to them, which are very much familiar to them. They try to apply that to Indian tradition and see how to approach a Indian philosophical tradition from a new perspective. And uh, uh, Suresh Chandra continues to say that it is the third kind of philosopher or third classification of philosophers who can really contribute a lot uh, for the progress of philosophy. Why I'm trying to say this, why I'm supporting uh, the claim of Suresh Chandra is that in order to appreciate our own culture, our own tradition, our own Indian philosophy, if we know uh, in Western philosophy also, then we can appreciate uh, our own tradition in a better way. For example, uh, we are very much fascinated by uh, uh, the, uh, the, the phenomenological movement of uh, Brenton on who's there. We are very much uh, familiar with uh, the analytical movement of the West uh, by, by Wittgenstein and others. We are very much uh, happy with the content uh, of uh, the hermeneutical uh, methodology or the hermeneutical method of philosophizing developed in the West. But if you look at uh, Indian philosophical tradition very closely, then you would understand all these methods, whether it is analytical method, or it is, uh, it is the phenomenological method or the hermeneutical method. Uh, all these are very much available in Indian philosophical tradition. But uh, we fail to understand it because uh, we don't have uh, the tools of uh, understanding the West. So if we know both Indian and Western tradition, that would help a lot because uh, it is the need of the hour to revisit some of the uh, some of the uh, contributions, great contributions made by our Indian thinkers, so that uh, one can understand how important Indian philosophy. There are various uh, various various uh, uh, met, uh, various uh, 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 contributions made by great thinkers, contemporary thinkers like uh, Professor R. Balasubramanian, who made an attempt to understand Advaita from the phenomenological side and hermeneutical side. And also we have Jain Mohanty, who used phenomenology to Indian philosophy, expertly to Advaita and Buddhism. And also we have a, a great professor, Subhijivan Bhattacharya Ji, uh, uh, one of the greatest philosophers of this country, who could use uh, the mathematical logic uh, to understand Navyanyaya. And uh, there are plenty of thinkers who my, uh, and uh, Jain Mohanty, of course. And then uh, we have uh, Matilal, a very beautiful thinker, very important thinker. And if you read his book, uh, especially there are many books, uh, I would like to quote one book of um, uh, Matilal that is Perception, wherein you can see how 
the Western understanding comes very close to Indian philosophical tradition. So some of our uh, great thinkers uh, uh, like uh, Monty or Balasubramaniam or uh, Subhijivanji and uh, others, uh, and also one more thinker uh, here I would like to quote is uh, great uh, uh, late uh, Professor uh, uh, Ganesh Mishra, who first made an attempt to understand uh, uh, Indian philosophy from, from the analytical tradition. So these are the great uh, contributions made by our own thinkers, uh, but uh, they are able to uh, successfully do this because uh, they have the tools of understanding. They know both uh, Western as well as Indian philosophy so that they could apply the uh, methodology of the West to the Indian tradition and see how far it is acceptable. In fact, uh, my teacher, Professor R.B. used to say that uh, our way of understanding of phenomenology is better than a Western uh, uh, phenomenological understanding of Israel or South or Idaho. So that is possible provided you read uh, both Indian and Western philosophy. So in the writings of Monty, you can see how he could interact with uh, the Western philosophy as well as Indian philosophy because uh, he has the tool of understanding both tradition and he could successfully apply how this could be uh, uh, contextualized in Indian philosophy. I'm, I'm just, I don't know whether I've exceeded time, but within five minutes I'll complete. Uh, one important theme uh, which uh, Mohanty undertakes uh, uh, in his writings is the theoretical and the practical aspects of uh, Western philosophy. And uh, uh, because uh, most of the time it is said that uh, Indian philosophy is uh, practical, whereas uh, Western philosophy is uh, theoretical. And uh, Mohanty says this conception is uh, totally wrong. This is a misconception, he says. He shows uh, how Indian philosophy is a combination of uh, both uh, theory and practice. Uh, I would like to quote him. He says, I think, I mean, this is from Mohanty. He says, I think the time has come when we should completely revise the way we have been talking about Indian philosophy in English language, unquote. He also uh, questioned uh, some unacceptable interpretations which have entered into Indian philosophical understanding. There has been a Western interpretation or translation and from Sanskrit writers. He analyzes the notion of time, for example, and concludes uh, that the Western readers, not knowing Sanskrit, not having a great deal of knowledge about our philosophical literature, arrived at it and found it very congenial because they found immediately a very interesting line of contrast between Eastern thinking and Western uh, uh, thinking. Now, of course, there are great, uh, very many great uh, Western thinkers who have understood uh, our Indian philosophy in proper perspective, but there are certain Westerners uh, who have understood uh, Indian philosophy in a wrong way. That is also uh, uh, has to be acknowledged. So, uh, Mohanty is of the view that uh, we have to be very careful, right? We have to be very careful in translating the Indian philosophical uh, uh, terms, right? In English and reject uh, uh, some of them which we have been using. So, this is uh, uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, achievement of uh, uh, Jain Mohanty. And finally, I would like to say, that Mohanty has used uh, a critical and evaluative and uh, the hermeneutical method to interpret uh, uh, Indian philosophical tradition. So he always believes that Indian philosophy is a dialogue. And uh, uh, one has to appreciate uh, uh, Mohanty for uh, making it open, for making Indian philosophy open to all. And also, he is of the view that there should be a critical dialogue between Indian and Western, Eastern and Western. That is possible, he says, provided you have the openness. Indian philosophers must have the openness to uh, react to some of the criticisms uh, uh, made by the Westerners. And also, he says, this is a very important point, he says, the Westerners must also have the open mind to read uh, Indian philosophical tradition which uh, sometimes uh, is absent. Now, this is my uh, last, uh, last uh, mm, uh, um, point. Now, the question 
that arises uh, uh, here is is mohanty a western philosopher or he indian philosopher because he has written extensively on western philosophy also equally uh, on western philosophy also so sometimes uh, uh, it is debated whether he is a western philosopher or indian philosopher or a philosopher who writes on western philosophy or a philosopher who writes on indian philosophy the question is raised by many uh, because uh, we have to place him in uh, a particular tradition though i am aware of uh, the limitation of this classification it is very helpful for us to understand uh mohanty's uh, writings no doubt uh, it is a rare phenomenon uh, to have a clear thinking about both uh, indian and western uh, only mohanty could possess uh, such a great uh, ability uh, but uh, where do we place him this is my my uh, major problem whenever i read uh, mohanty uh, because uh, his understanding of uh, usual theory of knowledge So, sorry, Husserl theory of meaning. And another book, uh, the concept of intentionality, is something which is uh, very remarkable. Now, uh, this question has been raised by. I'm just completing in two minutes. Uh, Professor, uh, this question has been raised by Professor Billy Moria, a uh, very very uh, interesting philosopher. In fact, he asked this question: Are there two Mohantis, each utterly different and speaking uh, two different languages? i mean one for the west and one for india mohanty's methodology in understanding the western and indian philosophical understanding are different he says shall we say that he is a synthesizer of both these two traditions this will create a problem according to me namely whether one has to apply the same methodology for indian and western philosophical understanding the methodologies definitely differ then where do we locate him should we say that he is an independent thinker not committed to any school of thought he plays a role of an excellent interpreter right whose uh, uh, value is something immeasurable so i would say that uh, mohanty has to be critically examined in order to answer this question whether he is a one who is a synthesizer of uh, both east and west or he is a indian philosophical uh, i mean indian thinker or a western thinker so but uh, uh, of course this is one 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 uh, question that comes to my mind whenever i read uh, monty as i said just now but uh, both these two thinkers have created a new uh, way of understanding indian philosophy i'm just concluding so this is very important for the main reason that there are different uh, ways of uh, understanding indian philosophy we appreciate uh, the great uh, contributions made by our ancient thinkers and the contemporary thinkers and also it is the need of our for us uh, to uh, revisit some of the concepts that are developed uh, in uh, classical contemporary and uh, uh, recent in fact uh, i would always uh, make uh, uh, a distinction between uh, contemporary indian philosophers and recent indian philosophers in recent indian philosophers i would uh, like to place uh, i mean by by recent indian philosophers i mean those philosophers uh, who were with us and who left recently or philosophers who are living with us uh, I, because no the contemporary uh, contemporary uh, uh, indian philosophy the can canvas is so vast we start from uh, uh, from uh, theosophical society and then moves includes everything everybody so i would like to make the distinction between contemporary and uh, recent indian philosophers and in recent indian philosophers uh, i would like to place thinkers like jain mohanty then uh, rajendra prasad uh, barlinge uh, subhijiban bhattacharya k okay, matilal and many others who made a tremendous contribution and it is a uh, need of the hour and it is very much essential for the departments of philosophy in uh, indian universities to discuss uh, the great contributions made by our own thinkers this is very much essential because after some time uh, their philosophy 
will be completely forgotten by our uh, young scholars in the sense that we have to teach uh, our young scholars about the great contributions made by uh, thinkers uh, like uh, daya and jain mohanty uh, sundarajan and many others so it is high time for us to re to revisit uh, some of the uh, important contributions made by our own thinkers so that uh, we can tell the academic world that how rich uh, our own uh, indian philosophy is how rich uh, we are and how we can uh, carry the values uh, for the future this one way of uh, uh, one way of serving indian philosophy uh, serving i am using the word serving because you know philosophy uh, uh, in india has to survive for the future we have to carry these values for the future so that uh, future of indian philosophy could be very much appreciated by the generations to come because the younger generations or the future philosophers they are the torch bearers so it is essential for us to teach uh, our uh, young minds about the contributions made by these great thinkers uh, thank you very much uh, i don't know whether i exceeded time uh, but uh, um, i i i i think i have done <laughs> justice to both these thinkers uh, so thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity and i am very grateful to the department of philosophy in jain college and also the icpr and also uh, my good friends who have attended uh, uh, this lecture especially professor dilip kumar mohanta and others uh, whose uh, contribution to philosophy is something remarkable so i am in fact i am privileged uh, to have uh, people like uh, monty sorry monta then uma ravi ravi sir and then others thank you very much friends thank, thank you so much sir for your uh, wonderful presentation now i request all the participants here uh, to raise your questions you can raise your questions in the chat box or, or you can unmute yourself and uh, ask questions directly to the speaker uh, um, uh, good morning dear sir this is vijay Hello, wow, Vijay. How are you? Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. It was such a joy to listen to you, sir, because uh, you know I was just uh, reminded of uh, uh, the lectures that I had heard of Dayaji directly when he had visited the Madras University in 2002, and later on at uh, in Delhi in 2003. Um, and uh, I was just trying to understand that. And recently, I had done a paper also on Dayaji, which was published by the Satyanilayam Institute. and uh, sir i just wanted to ask you uh, something about uh, this kind the, the the counter perspective raised by dayaji uh, there are some thinkers who have attributed uh, uh, you know the view that uh, indian philosophy is primarily oriented on moksha uh, creating such a view was basically done by dr radha krishnan to what extent is dr radha krishnan responsible for the creation of such a view and do you completely agree with this view that dr radhakrishnan was primarily responsible for the view that indian philosophy is primarily spiritualistic and uh, you know and there has been what is called as a watering down of the india's intellectual traditions as a result of this so i would like to know your opinion on yeah. that sir thank you sir uh, thank you thank you uh, vijay uh, for your wonderful question Yeah, I remember you were there when I organized the ICPR lectures of Daya in Madras University. Uh, now, uh, this is a very important question. Uh, Indian philosophy is moksha oriented. There is uh, one view maintained by many scholars, uh, traditional scholars, I would say, uh, but uh, this uh, I I cannot accept. Uh, like I I fully follow uh, uh, Daya. Uh, now, uh, with regard to the uh, Radha Krishnan, yeah, see Radha Krishnan's situation is something uh, different. Uh, I must tell you that Daya, um, I, I hope you know that 
Radha Krishnan studied in uh, Madras Christian College, uh, and uh, in the classroom, uh, I was told that uh, he was. Uh, he, uh, I mean, his teachers uh, used to criticize that Indian philosophy is moksha oriented. The Indian philosophy is talking about other worldly and all that one criticizing Indian philosophy all that time. So India Radha Krishnan has to write a, a MA dissertation, the ethics of Vedanta, showing how Vedanta philosophy has a relevance towards uh, 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 social uh, values and norms. This is one one important thing. So perhaps that uh, keeping it uh, that in mind, later he wrote Indian philosophy. Volume one and uh, two, a very very important uh, book, uh, no doubt. Books, no doubt, because it made a tremendous impact on the West uh, and uh, and uh, 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 philosophers uh, of the West also rejoiced uh, that uh, uh, his conception is something new. But uh, I have some difficulty in under uh, in accepting Radha Krishnan's position. Uh, of course, he has emphasized uh, moksha-oriented uh, philosophy, Indian philosophy, and it is spiritualistic and all that one. That is uh, that is uh, 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 that is a uh, uh, very important issue now. But uh, I have another uh, criticism against uh, uh, um, Radha Krishnan. What is that? See, Radha Krishnan uh, in each and every page. If you read uh, Indian philosophy volume one and two, you can see. how in each and every page he used to quote uh, either plato or hegel or bradley or any other western thinker in order to show that indian philosophy is uh, in no way inferior to that of uh, the west and uh, that in the, we to have a philosophy so he was using the westerners uh, spectacles and uh, he was uh, writing the entire indian philosophy For the sake of the Westerners, but uh, that was uh, 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 that was the need of the hour. Why? Because India, the Westerners considered as a uh, is full of uh, snake charmers. For example, they believed that India has no philosophy at all. So he has to show that we do have a philosophy, uh, and we do have concepts which are equivalent to that of uh, their uh, uh, concepts and all that one. But uh, by doing that, I always feel that he has uh, diluted uh, uh, Indian philosophical tradition. Uh, in uh, in fact, uh, many of the uh, uh, Indian uh, philosophers uh, uh, who wrote uh, during that time uh, had this conception. Uh, but perhaps that was uh, the need of the hour. But now, uh, I think uh, we have to revisit uh, some of the concepts. Uh, uh explained by these great thinkers of course we respect them uh, we admire them for their great contribution but uh, let us uh, look at uh, indian philosophy from a uh, new perspective now one one thinker whom I'm here i would like to quote is uh, uh, rajendra prasad uh, a, a great uh, uh, thinker trained in uh, western uh, uh, analytic philosophy and he argues uh, that uh, indian philosophy is uh, Uh, spiritualistic and transcendentalistic he talks about what is called yes t conception yes capital t conception t uh, capital so he says indian philosophy is spiritualistic as well as transcendentalistic so this conception of philosophy he believe we have developed in indian philosophy and that is one of the reason he says uh, that indian philosophy is dogmatic it is quite often it is said it is spiritualistic it is moksha oriented I, I don't believe that Indian philosophy he can be treated on par with the Western philosophical tradition. Like Daya, I would say Indian philosophy is a uh, is a philosophy proper in quotes. But uh, unfortunately, we have neglected this aspect. And uh, why? Uh, I mean, one of the reasons why 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 we have done that is that while in Indian philosophy, unfortunately, we talk about. Uh, only the metaphysical realm we have neglected the contributions made by uh, the the epistemologists and the logicians who have contributed substantially so metaphysics occupies a, a prime place in indian philosophy 
for example the great contributions made by shri arsha and then udayana all these are not uh, taken into account i'll give one example when uh, in 1963 when getier wrote uh, a three page article is uh, justified true belief knowledge because he has questioned the concept of knowledge because knowledge is quite often defined as truth uh, uh, belief and uh, uh, and uh, uh, justification it was uh, getier who questioned this uh, uh, three criteria and uh, it made a tremendous impact on the west you are now people are writing on that but uh, if you look at closely indian philosophical tradition gangisa who made an attempt long back a few centuries ago and uh, explained this concept in a beautiful way but we fail to read all these uh, uh, um, philosophical contributions epistemological or logical contributions of our uh, uh, of our own thinkers and i always feel that we always carry the metaphysical baggage uh, which contains uh, concepts like brahman concepts like uh, moksha or uh, spiritual uh, this thing all this uh, i think uh, i don't know whether i am permitted to say i would say that uh, this uh, has done a lot of uh, uh, damage to indian philosophical uh, thinking we are not open because we say and moreover uh, sorry i have taken more time but uh, this is very important that's why uh, we all why because indian philosophy uh, uh, we try to accept uh, follow indian philosophy or understand indian philosophy through some basic presupposition for example we say philosophy in india is moksha oriented it is spiritualistic in nature so this, there is there is a concept of brahman in you know, if you are an advait then you have to say brahma satyam jagan mitya so these are some of the basic proposition on which the entire uh, uh, indian philosophical tradition is built up so i would like to uh, open up uh, a new avenue what is that we have to develop a uh, different modes of understanding there are different ways of alternate ways of doing and here i would like to state since uh, we are delivering the lecture in aim jain college i would like to say the jaina methodology is uh, very much helpful in fact the jainas uh, or the philosophers who talk about the alternate ways of doing by developing the uh, uh, the sayadwara and others so there is uh, why why do why should we have a stereotype the method of uh, doing philosophy let us uh, Uh, uh let us uh, uh look at the indian philosophy from a new perspective so that uh, some new uh, ideas or new thinking will emerge i don't want to be a traditionalist i don't want my hands to be tied by the tradition i am open i am a, i have a free hand thank you thank you very much sir it was really an eye opener to listen to you thank you very much sir Thank, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, and uh, thank you for the question. And if any other person want to ask questions, I would uh, I would be happy if uh, my good friend, uh, philosopher and guide, if uh, Dilip ji can say something, because he is a very close associate of uh, Professor uh, Jain Mohanty. Uh, so I, I would be very much benefited, and all others. Uh, Would also be very much benefited by his uh, comments and uh, criticisms, of course, suggestions and all that one. Yeah. Dilip sir, uh, Dilip Kumar Mohan sir, sir, sir you you are mute sir. No, no. Dilip ji. Dilip sir, you unmute. you are on mute. Please unmute yourself. Unmute, unmute. Unmute. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, there is jagat satya also brahma satya jagan mitha i was in that reel so jagat is satya <laughs> thank you for uh, this uh, I, i thank the organizer for really uh, the for really inviting a, a speaker today a philosopher who i consider as a very efficient cook of philosophy for cooking <laughs> philosophical dishes you know uh, whatever that is the elements he has his own way of deliberation understanding cooking is very important in doing philosophy i consider so i consider my friend is a very good cook an efficient cook now the problem is how to 
uh, deal with this tradition and modernity. This is a really pro the problem that troubled, personally troubled me a lot. Who is a modern thinker? So I understand a thinker is modern if he inherits the past. But also he claims freedom from the past. This is very important. A philosopher cannot live in the past. This is orthodoxy very clearly he has pointed out. But I'm asking a question whether the philosopher has a future if he doesn't have a present. If you doesn't have a present, you cannot claim that you will have a future. So present is important for a philosopher and very, you know, not very hopeful state of Indian philosophy today in India, especially for the two reasons, which he has very nicely, very subtly pointed out, this orthodox way of understanding Indian philosophy and culture. If you go through the theses, you know, nowadays the website is available in the most of the universities' philosophy theses, especially written in Hindi or in, you know, other vernacular languages. They simply translate linguistic translations only, not translation of thought from Sanskrit to Bangla or Hindi. Very mm -hmm. pathetic, no development. And most of the damage has been done by the so-called Sanskrit people. They do not try to understand the thought. They only just try to understand the language. They are very orthodox. So, and orthodoxy is very deadly for philosophy. I'm very happy that Professor Panira Silman has very correctly pointed out this. Number two, those who are so-called modernist, they mm -hmm. say whatever is Western is good. Nowadays in education, you see in India, our political leaders, they're professing whatever is American is always good for India. And, 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 and surprisingly, you will see who are preaching this philosophy. The preaching, the people who has never traveled to USA, never lived there, never studied there, never taught there. They are the, the advocates of such a philosophy. This is also dangerous. This is one-sided and dangerous. If you organize this, you know, I'm very happy nowadays. I feel webinar is better. In a seminar, you will see. All the sadhus, all the babas, all the samijis or matajis are coming as if philosophy is theology. So dogmatic charge is also there. Secondly, I'm coming to this muksha oriented charge. Muksha I understand in a different way. I have tried to read little bit Sanskrit. Manchate iti muksha. In the Veda, it is just like urvarakam eva mukti bandana. So the aim of life is to be happy. Then how to be happy if you can get rid of the sufferings? Then how to address the question of sufferings? The philosophy gives you the way how to live. That is why openness is very much necessary in philosophy, either Western or Indian. And as you refer to Kesi Bhattacharya, Kesi Bhattacharya, you know, this uh, same article, Sarajin Ideas, but you see, Unless you can apply your sense of assimilation, you cannot claim to be a living philosopher. You can't have your present. All as you have to assimilate, you must be dynamic. Philosophical tradition, I, I would prefer to call traditional modernity. Or if I am permitted to uh, use a word called distancing nearness as said by Heidegger. This is a very fascinating idea. So we cannot ignore the past, but we must be conscious that we should not live within the boundary of the past. And this is, unless we can come out of this, he was referring to this uh, Western traditions. When I lived in past, in, in the Western countries, I have never found a person who is delivering a lecture on Khan and who does not know German who is delivering a lecture on Plato or Aristotle who doesn't know Greek. But it is very much fascinating in India. You do not, you should not know anything. 
of the, this language or culture. It is the not only Mehta, but Jain Mohanti. Jain Mohanti, he, he, he is well versed in German just like his mother tongue. He learned to it uh, in Calcutta while leaving. He learned with the traditional Pandits, the Sanskrit texts. This, you know, Odito Shriti and Nyaya text with the traditional scholars. So unless you can develop a culture, unless your thought is rooted in culture, you can't do fruitful philosophy. So these are the, uh, really, uh, this whole, these deliberations, I, I, I've been trying to listen very closely. I feel much educated, much educated. Always there is some nobility. Whatever he says, Professor Ponira Silva, I congratulate him. And I'm very happy. I also congratulate the organizer for giving me an opportunity to share uh, 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 some of the ideas. Thank you so much, sir. It's really, really uh, very, very pleasant occasion. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you so I much, sir. Of food there. I have cooked the food, no doubt. But whether I have spoiled the food or not, I don't know. Sir, <laughs> so your food was really delicious, sir. I am I'm learning cooking at my house. Okay. So, you see, uh, for Indian philosophy, I, I have very skeptical view about the development of Indian philosophy. I don't consider it is, I find it is mostly orthodox, there is orthodoxy, very little scope for open endedness. Uh, so we must fight for this cause. Yukti Siddham Bachagrajam is there in our traditions. Whatever is not reasonable is not acceptable. But we always bow down to what is irrational, uh, just like a preaching. So preaching is not philosophy. And always what is holistic, what is spiritualistic, these two words really is so troublesome to me. I think there will be some occasion that where we can discuss. Yes, sir. The limitations yes, sir. of this words. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to discuss more and more, but uh, uh, we, we all have uh, time constraints. So I think like uh, we will be recording. We are recording this uh, particular talk, and we will be uploading this in the YouTube. And uh, we think that uh, we'll have more discussions uh, uh, after seeing the talk and all. And also, this can be useful for the students as a resource material. Now we will go forward. I think we are not finding any other uh, questions in the chat box, and uh, and we are getting late. So uh, we'll move forward and we'll move to the next and last part of the lecture that is uh, delivering the vote of thanks. Myself, Prasanna Kumar uh, uh, Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy, Ponchet College would like to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the ICPR authorities uh, for uh, uh, granting the ICPR periodical lecture series uh, to the Department of Philosophy. I thank all the authorities of ICPR for the same. I thank uh, Professor S. Pani Selvam for his uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank uh, you. Thank we, we actually give him very short time to prepare, uh, but within a very short time period, uh, he came up with a very beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the whole Chennai philosophy community is in interpret to you, like uh, uh, like myself, uh, who has. Uh, 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 Pani Selvam, sir, is my supervisor and guide, and still he guides me all through life. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, thank you, thank being here as an inspiration. Now, i like to thank uh, our uh, secretary and associate secretary for uh, for all the encouragement and support uh, you are giving to us. And uh, I support, uh, I propose a word of thanks uh, to all the heads of the department uh, who have attended and who have encouraged us. Uh, our principal, Dr. N. Venkatraman, who delivered the presidential address, uh, I thank him. I also thank the Vice Principal, uh, Dr. Mahavir, uh, for his support and encouragement. I also thank all the staff members of all the departments, Shift 1 and Shift 2, for uh, giving their uh, support and encouragement. And I also thank all the office bearers uh, of Shift 1 and Shift 2, especially the Shift 1 Superintendent, uh, Dr. Uh, Ravi Chantan, for his uh, support and encouragement. Also, Shift 2 Manager, uh, Sankita Rajapa, for uh, uh, support and uh, encouragement. I also thank uh, 
the IQAC team for encouraging us and uh, uh, supporting us uh, to conduct this ICPR lecture series. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, lecture series. Uh, we had uh, three lectures. Uh, the first lecture was delivered by Dr. L. Vijay, he is also, uh, who is also present with us today. Thank you, uh, Vijay, uh, Dr. L. Vijay, for uh, joining with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, uh, the second lecture was delivered by Dr. Amita Valkminki. Uh, she was also with us, uh, but I think uh, she has left now. I thank her. Also, we had a lot of other uh, uh, faculty of philosophy from different parts of the country have joined. I thank all of them. Uh, especially, I thank uh, Uma Ma'am and uh, Dilip Shah uh, for uh, joining with us uh, uh, today. And uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the technical support, like especially uh, the computer mm -hmm. science department, uh, uh, Professor mm -hmm. Murbin, and all the other team for their support uh, mm -hmm. in conducting mm -hmm. the webinar in a smooth manner. Uh, I, I also um, uh, uh, propose my vote of thanks to Dr. S. Anantha Krishnan, mm -hmm. HOD Department of uh, History and mm -hmm. Jane College for all his support and encouragement. Uh, not, uh, uh, I also like to thank uh, our HOD, the pillar of our strength, uh, Dr. S. Manigatan, for all his support and encouragement. I also thank uh, my colleague uh, K. Sumitra for her support and encouragement. Once again, I thank all those participants uh, who have uh, joined uh, in the three uh, consecutive lectures uh, on 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Uh, I thank all our students and those who have uh, joined with us. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Now we will uh, wind up the lecture. Uh, actually, I have we have put the feedback link in the uh, chat box. So you can submit the feedback link and you will receive a <coughs> certificate. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you. We'll wind up the session with the national anthem. Thank you. Sir, what is it? Sir, what is it? Sir, what is it? Sir, what is it? So thank you, sir.